smile some, at somebody real big and tell them I feel good. Amen. Praise God. Remain standing with me. If you'd like to turn in your Bibles, go with me. I want to read a couple of passages. One from Colossians chapter 3. And then back just a few pages to Philippians chapter 3. It is so good to see you today. We finally got everybody back from COVID and then vacation hit. And, uh, but some of you are back from vacation today, so we're glad you're here. And if you're a newcomer, we're glad you're here. I know it's a holiday weekend and people traveling, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Give the Lord praise and thanks. Thank God. Hallelujah. Look with me in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If you're there, say amen. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. Now notice verse, verse 1, he said, seek those things which are above. In verse 2, he said, set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. And then if you'll flip back a page or so to Philippians chapter 3. I'll read, begin reading in verse 20. If you actually pick up the end of verse 19, it talks about the danger of people who set their mind on earthly things. But in verse 20, he says, For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait, eagerly wait for the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body or that it will be like his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself I want to preach this morning if the Lord will help me on what will happen in heaven what will happen in heaven? What will happen in heaven? Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for this moment. God, I, I, I want to do my best to embrace the moment, embrace you in this moment, not have my mind in, just in tomorrow or yesterday, but right here and right now, because you're here, right here, right now. And I thank you for every person here. And God, I pray that you would speak to us in this moment of time, I pray for your anointing. Lord, we need you. If we have ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. God, I pray that you touch lives. God, that we wouldn't come here just to go through the motions of church or the rituals of religion. But Lord, that men and women would have an encounter with you today. In these moments, God, that's what makes all the difference. And I pray that you'd make yourself real, that we'd be surrendered to you, and that we'd see the results of that around these altars today, God, and that our mind would be on, on heaven and on you. And we give you praise. Thank you for your touch and empowering. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord one more time. Before you're seated, tell, tell somebody I'm looking forward to heaven. If we aren't careful, we have made heaven 
so ethereal and mystical that it's not real. And it's not real to us. We, we think this, this world that you can experience with your five senses, that you can see and taste and touch and feel and smell, we, we think this is what's real. But I'm here to tell you and just remind you today, folks, heaven does not fall in the category of the fairy tales that we grew up with. Heaven is not a fairy tale. Heaven is real. <clears throat> in fact, it's so real that the clear teaching of Scripture is, and, and, and we need this so much right now, he teaches us this, especially both in Colossians and Philippians, but especially there in Colossians. We need this so much right now that we, the, the, the clear teaching of Scripture is that we are not to allow our minds and our thinking to be dragged down with the things of earth. I don't care if it's political, social, what's going on in the world condition what's going on in your world, the clear teaching of Scripture is don't let your mind and your thoughts be preoccupied and dragged down with the things of this earth. Your mind and your thoughts, your thinking is to be set on heaven and on what's above. Amen. We, let, let me pause here just a second. We get far more consumed with CNN or Fox or whatever it is that you watch or sports or what's going on in your world or, or, or day-to-day living or family or whatever and we think very little about heaven. He said, set your mind on things above. Don't worry yourself if you're preoccupied with everything going on in the world around you, baby. That's not going to last. There is a world to come that's going to last. And he said that's where you need to be focused. In fact, as we approach and accelerate into the end times and the last days, one of the most basic, maybe the most basic tactic in the survival guide that he gives us is if you're going to make it in the end times, get your mind on heaven. Get your mind on heaven. Get your mind on heaven. <clears throat> now it becomes such a, a beautiful picture of this place that he's taking us to. In fact, there's a picture when Jesus left this earth, it's a major part of doctrine in church history that we don't talk much about anymore. We talk about the crucifixion and the resurrection, but rarely do we talk about the ascension. And yet when Jesus ascended back to heaven to sit down at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for you and me, which is his present day ministry, he's got all he can handle. Look over and tell somebody, Jesus has got all he can handle praying for you. He went back to the right hand of the Father and the way he went becomes a picture of the way you and I are going there. Look with me on the screen in Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. said, Now when he had spoken these words, while they watched, he was taken up. Everybody say taken up. You say, how's the rapture going to happen? How, how are we getting there? We're going to be taken up. He was taken up and a cloud was, come on, I, I'm kidding with you. We can do rapture drills, but the Bible said it's not going to happen that way. He was taken up. He was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. Well, somebody praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I don't care if the world thinks we're crazy or not. It's still the truth. 
And if it happened with Jesus, it's going to happen with me and you. He was taken up. Somebody say taken up. The only difference between what happened to him and what will happen to us if we're still living when the rapture takes place and Jesus comes to, to take us home, the only difference is the speed at which it transpired. It, he went slow enough that they were able to watch him, but the Bible said when it happens for you and me, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the trump, hallelujah. Didn't even say the blink of an eye. Said in, the tw in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the trumpet shall sound, and this mortal will put on immortality, and this corruptible will put on incorruption, and we shall be changed, and we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. Hallelujah. Now that's reality. That's more real than anything you, what you see on CNN. Because most of that ain't true anyway. Everybody smile. But now when we think about the end times and, and, and the rapture and our going to heaven, and, and that's a picture of how we're going to get there. We're going to be taken up. Say it with me one more time. I'm going to be taken up. A lot of the time, we and, and G, Jesus does tell us, God does tell us in his word what's going to happen. He's done that all through history. It's one of the great proofs that, that of the authenticity of the Scripture and that God is who He says He is. Prophecy is, is history written in advance. It's more current than tomorrow's newspaper. Jesus fulfilled every prophecy when He came the first time and He's going to fulfill every prophecy when He comes the second time. And he tells us what's going to happen, but a lot of times we get preoccupied when the rapture takes place and there's seven years of tribulation on the earth. And there will be unprecedented suffering on the earth as judgment comes upon the world. And we are for, upon a world that rejected him. Judgment wasn't God's choice. He sent his son so we didn't have to experience judgment. He's done everything in his power so we wouldn't have to experience judgment. Judgment will come on the earth and we get, we get kind of preoccupied with that. And we, we tend to think during the seven years of tribulation about what's going to be happening here on the earth. And, and that is laid out in scripture and he tells us in advance what's going to happen. But for a few minutes this morning, I, during the seven years of tribulation after the rapture and when we're taken to heaven, I don't want to talk about what's going to happen here on earth. I want to talk about what's going to happen in heaven. Hallelujah, because that's where I'm going to be. I said that's where I plan on being. So that's where my focus is. I, I, I pray God will have mercy on those who are still here and didn't make it. But I don't plan on being here. I plan on being there. Now there are at least during those seven years, tribulations coming on the earth while we're in heaven. I want to talk about for just a few minutes about four things according to scripture that we know are going to happen while we're in heaven. Hallelujah. Come on, baby. If you can't shout on this, you, you done backslid. I mean, you're in trouble if you can't shout on this. <clears throat> what will happen? And because as we become secure, Jason, in that hope and get our mind on that, get our mind off things on earth and get our mind on what's going to happen in heaven, it gives me strength for whatever's going on right now because I know it's not permanent. I know God has a higher plan. Well, somebody praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. We, we, we get, you know, we get so caught up and floating around on, you know, on a cloud with angel wings strumming on a harp. We, we, it's just not even real to us. But I'm telling you, heaven's real. You say, what's going to happen in heaven during that time, Pastor? Number one, the Bible says there is a ready room. A ready room. Look at what the scripture said in John 14. This is the way Jesus described it. A ready room. Everybody say a ready room. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. And if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, he emphasizes the preparation. He says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again 
and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Now here's a tidbit that we don't always catch or realize. Did you know that for the Old Testament saints, the, 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 the revelation, God reveals things. The further you go through time and the further you go through Scripture, God keeps revealing more and more line upon line, precept upon precept. And in the Old Testament, they didn't have as much revelation of heaven. There are glimpses of it, but they didn't have as much revelation of it. But heaven for them did not exist at that time. There was a place called paradise. And there's scripture for all of this. But heaven only came into being once Jesus returned to heaven to prepare that place for us. And he's been working. Come on here now. He's been working to, to prepare that place. Have you ever been traveling? Maybe you've been driving all day and you were worn out and the kids have been screaming and you're just happy to get out of the car and get into a hotel room and, and you try to, you're trying to check in but something's happened and your room's not ready. That, that, that is a bad feeling because you're worn out. You've been on a long journey. You just want to go lay down. You, you, you just want to relax, but your room's not ready. And, and you wait, and, and, you know, and, and, and you're there, and, you, and the kids, you're laying on the luggage, and you're trying to keep the kids from killing one another. And finally, they come and tell you, your room's ready. And you're ready to shout right there. Can I tell you, it's been a long, hard journey. But one of these getting up mornings before long, Jesus is going to come and he's going to catch us home and he's going to say, your room's ready. I, hallelujah. I've been getting stuff prepared and your room's ready. Amen. Glory to God. I, I don't know if, if you can grasp with me the personal dimension of that. I mean, I'm not just talking about somebody else's room. I'm talking about your room, that he loves you so much that he's been preparing a place just for you. Just for you. Sometimes Jennifer and I watch these movies, and we, we love to watch uh, BBC and some of these period pieces, and, and, and they'll show some of these old English castles and, and mansions, and, and, and they'll always go in the library, and they got... That you know what I'm talking about? That the walls are covered with books. And, and, and every time I see that, I say, oh, God, that's heaven to me. If you're, if, if you're getting my place ready, Lord, make it like that. Because that's, that's, that's what I, that may not do a thing for you, but that, that, that'd be heaven to me. And, 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 and Jesus is going to say your room's ready. Now, I want you to think about this. If God took seven days and one of them was a day of rest, to bring about creation, to create this world that we live in, that has sustained humanity all these years. And, and, and we consider the beauty and the glory and the wonder of nature. I mean, not only do we have trouble conceiving heaven, we can't even wrap our mind around what he's done here on earth. I mean, every snowflake is unique. Every fingerprint is different. The, the, the beauty and the wonder of this world. But God made this world in six days. He's been working on heaven 2,000 years. Can you imagine what heaven will be like? If he did the world in six days, what's heaven going to be like with him having 2,000 years to work on it? To prepare it. For, I, that blows my mind. I don't know if that does anything for you or not, but that blows my mind that I can't even begin to imagine what heaven will be like. And so what will happen in heaven? Well, finally, your room's ready. Say it one more time. Say, your room's ready. So there's a ready room in heaven. Number two, here's the second thing that will happen. There is reward. There is reward. Now, give me my scripture from Corinthians here. <coughs> the Bible says... In 2 Corinthians 5 and 10, for we must all, everybody say all. all. Nobody's getting out of it. All appear before the judgment seat of Christ 
that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now there are some different judgments that are going to take place. But this judgment, at the judgment seat of Christ, when we get to heaven, for the saints, this, this, this is not about your salvation. Your salvation was determined at Calvary. When you accepted Jesus, He said you're worthy because you're covered by the blood. Come on. When you get to heaven, there's not going to suddenly, and we get to the judgment seat, there's not suddenly going to be some trap door that opens up and shoots you back down to hell because you weren't good enough after all. It's not going to happen. One of the weaknesses in our stream of faith, some other people go to the other extreme, but a lot of times we're not secure enough in our salvation. I want to tell you, brother, his blood has made me clean. If he don't make me worthy, there ain't no hope of me ever being worthy. When you get to heaven, this is a judgment of reward. This is not about your salvation, but it is about your motives and the works that you did and anything that was done from pride or personal gain will be burned up. Some of us, sometimes we think somebody did a, did a whole lot for God in this life. This is where it's going to show. Because if it was out of selfishness or pride or personal gain, it will be burned up. But if I did it with a pure heart, the Bible said this is a judgment of reward. There's reward coming. The Bible said there's a crown. <clears throat> Paul said, when he came to the end himself, he said, in Timothy, he said, I fought a good fight, I finished the race, I kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up, he was certain of it, just like you and I need to be. He said, henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but to all those who love his appearing. Who love his appearing. Now this crown. Go ahead. That's all right. Hallelujah. The judgment seat. The, the Greek is Bema. The Bema seat. And the Bema seat in that day. Not only did they settle court cases at the Bema seat. But they also rewarded competitive sports. And so, Chuck, I've not always understood this. Sometimes I've had trouble getting my mind around it. Because when I think of a crown, I think of title and position. I think of king and queen. But the crown that's in that day that was awarded at the Bema seat for winners of competitive sports, it was the crown was not that he was talking about here was not title and position. This crown was victory and reward. You had won the race. You had won the race. You had run well. You had made it. That's the crown he's talking about. Hallelujah. This crown is not king and queen title and position. This crown is victory and reward because you've run and run well and made it to the finish line. There's something to be said for finishing. A lot of people start well, but you got to finish. So what will happen in heaven? There's a, a ready room. I want to tell you one more time. Your room is just about ready. There's a ready room. There's a reward. And number three, the Bible says... There is a royal wedding. There's a royal wedding. I remember years ago when Prince Charles and Princess Diana got married. Her train was so long, it looked like it was a mile long. I mean, all the way down that aisle and out the building. My Bible said, I serve a God. The train of his robe fills the whole temple. It's so big. There's a royal wedding. There's going to be a reward, a judgment of rewards for what was done in this life with a pure heart. But there's a royal wedding. Look in Revelation 
It's coming up here, Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. Come on. While he's preparing heaven, you ought to be preparing you. Her wife, his wife has made herself ready and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen clean and bright for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints then he said to me write blessed are those there were sometimes he told him shut up the book don't write it but there were some things he said write I want people to know this because if they know what's coming it will give them hope and strength to get through whatever they're going through to make it here He said, write this, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. In other words, you can bank on this. No matter what else comes or goes, you can depend on this. These are the true sayings of God. There's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah. Are you listening to me? A royal wedding, that's what's going to happen. Folks, listen. There has never been a wedding like this one. I want you to listen real close. There's never been a wedding like this one. Never has there been a more worthy groom. Never has a man sacrificed more for his bride. Never has a man gone to greater lengths, humbled himself more, endured more, or accomplished more in winning his bride. Never has a wealthier father planned a bigger feast. Never has a more noble son honored his father. Never has a man treated his bride-to-be more appropriately. Never has a more valuable engagement ring been given to a bride than the Holy Spirit. Never, I I, I have trouble reading this and not shouting. Never has a more gorgeous new home been prepared for a bride. Never has a groom done more to qualify his beloved to be his bride. Never has a bride needed her groom more. Never has there been a wedding more significant than this one. Never has a prince with more authority taken a bride with less standing. Never has a bride had her prince die for her, rise from the dead, and give her new standing before the father. Never has a groom loved his bride more. Never has a bride waited as long for her groom. Never has a bride sung more songs to her lover. Never has there been a wedding with more guests than this one will have. Never has a wedding taken place on a more momentous occasion. I want to tell you there has never been a wedding like this. You sit and look at me, I'll read it again. (laughs) Glory to God. All of us get so caught up in the stuff of this life. We have been way too preoccupied with what's going on in this world. He said, get your mind off things below There's some stuff going to happen. There's some stuff that's coming. You can mark it down. There's a ready room. There's a reward. And there's a royal wedding. I can't do it justice. It defies words. Folks, just as surely as you got out of the bed this morning, 
put your feet on the floor, brushed your teeth, put your socks on, or however you were attiring yourself, drove in the car, and walked to this building, just that surely only more so, heaven is real. It's not just ethereal. It's not just mystical. And when I can get my mind centered there, I don't sweat all the stuff here. Here's the fourth thing. There's a ready room. and I'm talking about what's happening in heaven, especially during those seven years. Tribulation may be going on on the earth, but there's going to be some stuff happening in heaven. There's a ready room. There's a reward. There's a royal wedding. And fourthly, there's a return. The first phase, the second coming, happens at the rapture when we're called up to meet him in the air and he takes us back to heaven for these things that I've been talking about. But the second phase of the second coming, when he comes, there's a return and we come with him. He comes riding a white horse and we come on horses with him, the armies of the Lord, and he doesn't just appear in the clouds. He sets foot on the earth. He sets foot on the Mount of Olives and he comes to execute judgments on his enemies and reign in victory and you and I come with him. Zechariah chapter 14. I had them get Zechariah 14 and 5. And, but I, I, I want to read just a little more in that. If you want to go with me, you can. But in Zechariah chapter 14, beginning at verse 3, it says, and again, we're returning with him. It says, then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to us all. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Hallelujah! One of the things the last while and I've told you this that I felt so much on my heart as a pastor is that it's my job I don't pastor everybody but for the people God has given me it's my job to prepare you all kind of things are going on in the world and we're accelerating toward the last days but as I prepare you I don't want to scare you to death because that's not going to help anybody. And furthermore, we don't have to be afraid. The victory's already been won. And it brings me tremendous peace and confidence when I turn off the news and get my face in the Word of God and begin to read what He's already said. Is going to happen. And I'm here to tell you there are some things going to happen in heaven. And whether I go by way of the grave or by way of the rapture, I plan on being there. I know there's going to be some things happen on this earth. 
that man chose because of his sin and rebellion. But I'm going to tell you something. I'm much more concerned about what happens in heaven because that's where I plan on being. I don't plan on being here. I plan on being there. And you're not going to make it because you're a good person or a nice guy. You have to surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Repent of your sins. And when you really do it, surrender to Him. And when you really do that, He will give you a radically different kind of life. And if you think you're saved, you know what really scares me? Is all the people who have deceived themselves. Because there are all kind of people who think they're going to heaven. Jesus said on that day, I'll say, I didn't know you. And there are times I can be sure of my salvation, but there are also times for me, to, the Bible said, to examine myself. Be sure what my standing is before the Lord. Today you can't depend on good works or being a nice person or any of that. You got to know Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. There is no other way to the Father except by me. Say, oh, pastor, some of these people, what about these people, other religions? They're sincere. Yeah, they're sincerely wrong. The word said, there is no other name. There is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. And he tells us the way we're going to make it through is because we know, and you got to keep that in the forefront of your mind, we know whatever things look like right now is not all there is. There's a heaven for the righteous. There's a heaven for the righteous. There's a hell for the wicked. And that's basic gospel, but it's the truth. Stand with me.